All right, let's pick up on 104. We do a little bit of review. Formula on the board we mentioned is uh, frequency equals the speed of light divided by the wavelength of a waveform. Also, one of the things that I, I may come up again, but I mentioned yesterday, is that in the book they refer to light as more than just what we see, what our eyes can see. Remember that light itself is an energy wave. It's an electromagnetic wave. And that there's electromagnetic waves that are, have longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths than our eyes can see. And just because we can't see them doesn't mean they're not referred to as light. Okay? Light is more than just the light we can see. It's a phrase that's used for much more of the electromagnetic spectrum. Matter of fact, the first time I read this chapter uh, last year, and so when I saw it as I read through the chapter again this year, reminded me of this, is that at times in the book they refer to things like radio waves as light. Now we don't think of radio waves as light. If you were sitting in your car tuning your, your radio and you could see all the different frequencies of radio waves that are bombarding you, if we could see all of those and they came across to us in, in the form of light, we'd be blinded. Because right now there's so many radio waves going through this space. But they do refer to radio waves as light as light waves, because they're still in the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember, radio waves and sound waves are different things, right? But radio waves are more like light, and they are just a different frequency of the same kind of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. You can see on the chart on our figure on page 105, figure 311, where they lay out symbols of all these different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from gamma rays on one side, and who infamously toyed around with gamma rays and suffered the consequences from it? David Banner. The Hulk. Right? Gamma radiation. Changed David Banner, mild-mannered Dr. David Banner, into the Hulk. So we know, obviously, from that true story how serious gamma wave radiation can be. But all the way on the other end, they list here AM radio on the electromagnetic spectrum, which they refer to all of those as light, though the visible spectrum we can see on this chart here, you see it between ultraviolet and infrared. All right. Notice under ultraviolet, what do they have there as a symbol? It's not toothpaste, by the way. I said it's not toothpaste. What do you think that, if you can read really small, which I can't anymore, even with my cheaters on, I can't read that small, but I know what it is. Sunscreen, right. So what they're saying is when you go out into the sun, the, s the actual light energy that burns you is in the ultraviolet range. You can't see the ultraviolet light, but what gives you a sunburn is the ultraviolet light. The energy that's in that ultraviolet range is what actually is killing your cells. And the result of a large number of those cells being killed is a burn is a sunburn. So you're actually killing the s skin cells by exposing yourself to ultraviolet radiation when you're tanning and then ultimately burning. So the sunscreen they put on is a shield that blocks out that frequency of light. It's like sunglasses for your skin. Okay? And that's one of the concerns too. William is often, off is often offering me old pairs of sunglasses. Now my wife wears sunglasses all the time. Mrs. Baker's always wearing sunglasses. I've never worn sunglasses except when I was over in you know, places where the Marine Corps sent me, where it's incredibly, incredibly bright. Saudi Arabia, Somalia, places like that. Most of my time with anything shielding my eyes was with a visor from my helmet when I was flying helicopters. And so I'm not used to having glasses on that shield my eyes. I'm used to the full shield of a helmet. But part of my concern also is if you buy really cheap sunglasses, you may here on commercials about sunglasses that have UV, UV protection. Have you heard that? They've got UV protection in the sunglasses. See, one of the dangers is if you buy really cheap sunglasses, which these aren't sunglasses, they're just glasses, but I'm holding them like a prop, right? If you have really cheap sunglasses, they may block the visible spectrum light. So you put them on, and what happens when your eyes go into the shade? What physically happens to your eyes, do you know? What mechanically happens to your eyes? Okay. So your iris, the center of your eye is going to open up. It's going to get bigger, right? What does that do? Why is, why is the iris opening up? Okay. 
So your iris opens up because now your eyes are in the shade and they need more light to see. So the iris opens up. But if the cheap glasses don't block the ultraviolet light, what have you just done? You've opened up a gateway for additional ultraviolet radiation to get into your eyes because you can't see it. You're not going to squint or your iris isn't going to close because of ultraviolet. So we put cheap sunglasses on that don't have ultraviolet protection. Your irises will open up. You allow more ultraviolet damage to get into the back of your eye. So wearing cheap glasses could be worse than wearing no glasses because you're opening yourself up for that damage to, to happen to the back. So anyway, just something to think about as you go to the speedway and buy your $2 glasses and go to the beach. You're frying the back of your eye. On the top of page 106, they refer back to, there's, two, there's a couple different definitions in blue. And you should be able to figure these statements out from this formula on the board. We talked about it yesterday. We talked about how that frequency and wavelength are inversely related. They're inversely related, meaning we used a couple of numbers on the board, but this idea of inversely related means when one goes up, the other one must go down. Okay? If two things are directly related, let's say you're working on a, some Algebra 2 homework, and you're asked, okay, why equals 7x. How are y and x related? Hopefully you come back and say they're directly related. How do you know? Because when x goes up, y goes up. See? It's seven, y is 7 times x. So if x is 1, y is 7. If x is 2, y is 14. If x is 3, y is 21. They're directly related. When one goes up, the other one goes up. They have to. But if you had this on the board, you would say y and x, they are indirectly or inversely related. Why? W-H-Y, question mark. Okay. Because when one goes up, the other one must go down. Okay. So if y, if we need a larger y over here, hopefully you see that the only thing that can affect that is by making x smaller. As x gets smaller, y would get larger, and vice versa. Because, in much the same way, we rearrange this formula, y times x equals 7. It's a constant. It doesn't change. Meaning these two things multiplied together always have to equal 7. So when one goes down, the other one has to go up to keep them equal to 7. In that same way here, the speed of light is a constant. It doesn't change. If you want to think of it kind of like 7, it's not, though. It's 3.08 times 10 to the... Pardon? No, it's not negative. 3.08 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It's a constant, though, right? It doesn't change. So, frequency and wavelength are equal to speed of light, which is a constant. So in just the same way that x and y need to multiply together to equal a constant of 7, meaning if one goes up, the other one has to go down, in the same way, frequency and wavelength multiplied together have to equal the constant of the speed of light. So if one of these goes up, the other one has to go down. They cannot both go up. If they both went up, then we just change the speed of light. And for this class, we are going to assume that the speed of light is constant. Okay. Because there are theorists out there who question that, that we can change the speed of light. And if we can change the speed of light, guess what? Then everything becomes up for grabs. So we're going to hold the speed of light to be constant at 3.08 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We talked about a hertz a little bit. Actually, let me go back to before hertz. I want to get to this idea. So on the top of 106, it says, a light wave's frequency, as it increases, as the frequency increases, its energy increases. Increasing frequency, the way I would write this in my notes, is that increasing frequency results in increasing energy. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Increasing energy. The energy that's being transmitted by that wave as its frequency goes up, the energy in it goes up. 
Okay, so if we're comparing two different waves, if one wave has a higher frequency than the other wave, the higher frequency wave has more energy that it's impacting objects with. It has more energy in it. Higher frequency means higher energy. And in the same way, lower frequencies are lower energies. So higher frequency, higher energy, lower frequency, lower energy, just the way they relate to each other. Now, what does that mean? You see the second set of blue lines. It says as a light's wavelength increases, its energy decreases. Why? Because wavelength and frequency are inversely related, right? So another way to say decreasing frequency is also to say increasing wavelength. An increasing wavelength means it, means it has to have a decreasing frequency. And energy is based upon the frequency. So increased wavelength means decreased frequency, which means less energy. Over here, decreasing wavelength is equals a higher frequency, and therefore it's a higher energy. So if you're comparing two waves, you say which one of these has more energy in it, which one is gonna impact with more energy, which has more energy to give, there's different ways to think about it. But in terms of the energy, if you're comparing two wavelengths, or two waveforms, the one with the greater frequency has the higher energy. And because it has a higher frequency, it must have a smaller wavelength. If you have that waveform, let's say between my hands there's a waveform, one complete crest to crest between my hands. As I take that and as I squeeze it together, the, wave, the wavelength gets smaller and smaller, right? Here's crest to crest. As I squeeze it together, it gets smaller and smaller. But because it's getting smaller and smaller, it's happening more and more rapidly. That high expectation, that high energy that you would, something slow and meandering, as I squeeze it, it becomes very rapid. That amount of energy that it takes me even to demonstrate that, it takes more energy to demonstrate it, so think of it that way. It takes more energy to demonstrate it, so it has more energy in it. If it's a nice, slow, deep ocean wave, there's not a lot of energy in that. There's a very long wavelength, has a very small frequency, has very little energy compared to taking that same wave, bringing the waves closer and closer and closer together, getting smaller and smaller wavelength, getting higher and higher frequency, getting more and more energy. Okay? So, as light waves wavelength increases, its energy decreases, and as the wavelength decreases, its energy increases. Now, as I was rereading the chapter last night, one of the things I recognize is that we skipped over something that I remember could be important. So I want you, this is kind of a step back, but when we were talking about frequency and wavelength, and actually frequency and amplitude, okay? So you with me on that? The wavelength and the, the frequency are related to one another, and then we've got amplitude of the wave. Whether the wave has a small amplitude, meaning that it's, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw let's see. Let's see. We've got a waveform like this, and let's say below it we have a waveform that looks like this. Okay. If we're talking about visible light between these two different wavelengths, which one of these two, which one of these two, well, how do I put it? What's, what's, let's say that their amplitude is exactly the same. That's one way to approach it. Let's do it that way. Let's say that they both have the same Amplitude. I know it's not the scale, but let's say that their amplitude, the distance above or the distance below, on both of these waveforms, that they're all equal. Okay? This one comes as much above and below as this one does. The same above and the same below. They have the same amplitude. They obviously have different frequencies, but they have the same amplitude. When we're looking at light, that comes across to us as brightness. Okay? If I have the same waveform here, if I have the same frequency, which again, I'm going to be very difficult to replicate, but let's say that it's the same frequency, but its amp amplitude is much greater. Okay, that doesn't work. Let me do it over here. Let me do it on top of this one. Something like that, where it's actually higher and lower than the original form. 
the greater the amplitude, the brighter it's going to appear to us. Okay. So if I have a waveform and you see it, it's a certain color and it's got a certain intensity, the lights are off and you see that light, as I make the amplitude greater, it's going to appear to you like I'm making the light brighter. It's going to be the same color, but it's going to be brighter. Amplitude is brightness. Okay? So a question might say, you have a certain waveform and you increase the amplitude. What does it look like just happened? It, the light got brighter. It's the same color, but it got brighter. It's the same color because we haven't changed the frequency. We've only changed the amplitude. Another question might be, you're looking at a light and it's shifting. And you're shifting from red to yellow. Red through orange to yellow. What's happening? If the color is changing, then the wavelength is changing. The frequency is changing. So color changes are because of wavelength and frequency changes. Brightness is due to the amplitude. So if I have two, two lights, if I have their, their waveforms in front of me, and they are the same amplitude with different frequencies, they would both appear to be equally bright, but different colors. If I have two lights in front of you that have the same frequency, then they would both have the same color, but if one of them had a higher amplitude, it would be brighter than its neighbor. Okay? So amplitude is brightness, frequency and wavelength are color. That's how those things appear to our eyes. In this discussion of um, ultraviolet as well, as I was talking about your eyes, they mentioned in the book the ozone, the ozone layer. And I think it's next module we actually get into chemically what the ozone layer is and how ozone is used to protect us. But for here, just recognize that the ozone layer is very similar to sunscreen. Okay, ultraviolet light in the ozone layer. And one of the, one of the concerns in science today in terms of global climate change, it used to be global cooling and now it's global warming and then it was, now it's global climate change because we can't figure out if it's warming or cooling because it's doing both. What is it when you have a p net positive or n positive charges and negative charges and they come together and, oh, that's net neutral? Okay. Anyway, don't, don't want to sound like a skeptic. But we have both temperatures cooling and temperatures warming. So we call it temperature climate change because it's different in different places, but the net is pretty close to being the same. But I digress. This idea of the ozone layer and the concern is that there are holes in the ozone layer. We've got some reasons why there are holes, and we can talk about that when we get into that chapter. But for right now, just realize that the ozone layer acts as a type of sunscreen for the Earth that there are more ultraviolet rays coming down that would burn you, but the vast, ma the vast, vast majority of those are being handled by the ozone layer, being taken care of naturally, with a naturally occurring, continuously repeating reaction that's happening in the atmosphere. So the concern is that there are holes in the ozone, and I'm not a total skeptic, by the way, I'm just trying to, I maybe played that up a little bit for you, but, but where there may be holes in the ozone, those are places where Figuratively speaking, the Earth's iris has opened up and we don't have the protection any longer. So through those holes, more ultraviolet radiation can hit the Earth and actually burn you and other things. Ultraviolet radiation kills living cells. The ozone layer prevents that from happening. Okay, So where the ozone may be thin or may be missing, that's an area of concern. We'll talk about that in detail. We get to the chemistry of the ozone layer later on. On page 107, we get into the relationship between frequency and energy, which I already wrote on the board. The higher frequency, the lower frequency, how they relate to one another, you know, higher frequency, higher energy. There's actually a formula we're going to be using for that, that the energy of a waveform is equal to H times F. The E is the energy. And the energy is equal to H is Planck's constant, named for Max Planck. My Planck's constant, I think he was German.
So energy equals Planck's constant times frequency. So just in the same way that I said before, let's say that y is energy, y is equal to 7x. In this case, I said every time x goes up 1, energy goes up a multiple of 7. So in the same way over here, as frequency increases, it increases, and when frequency increases, the energy increases by a multiple of Planck's constant. Here, y would increase by a factor of 7. Here, it increases by a factor of Planck's constant. Planck's constant is 6. 0.63 times 10 to the negative 31st or 34th one per hertz. It's on page 107. Joule per, joule hertz, right? Joules per hertz. That's what it was. Joules per hertz. Joules per hertz. Remember, hertz is a one per second. So that's the way we say one per second. So hertz is a, is a term that means frequency. How many cycles per second is what hertz means. If I say something is the frequency of 60 hertz, that means it's oscillating 60 times per second. So energy, just look at the units here. We've got energy is equal to, what are the units of energy? Well, they're going to be joule, joules per hertz times frequency. What is the units of frequency? Hertz. Joules per hertz times hertz. These cancel out, and so our energy is going to be in joules. Our units are going to be joules. So how many joules of energy is by using Planck's constant times the frequency in hertz? Example 3.3. Three. Let's look at that together. I'll do it on the board, but you have it in the book. A light wave has a frequency... of 2.3 times 10 to the 16 hertz. What is its energy? So we're just direct use of the formula. That's all we're going to be doing here. Energy equals HF, which equals 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per hertz times 2.3 times 10 to the 16th hertz. Okay. It's noisy food. So the energy there If you remember from your math with scientific notation, we could pull out right now the, the scientific notation, what it's going to be at the other side. How, when I look at this, this is just my technique, okay? When I see a problem like this, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 31st times 2.3 times 10 to the 16th, I first pull out all of the scientific notation factors, the times tens to the whatever. What this reduces down for me is 6.63 times 2.3 times 10, and now we need to reconcile the scientific notation. What is negative 34 times 16? How do we handle that mathematically? When you multiply scientific notation, you add the exponents. So negative 34 times 16 would be, times 10 to the negative 34 4th times 10 to the 16th would be the same as times 10 to the negative 34th plus 16. And so we would get negative 18 there, right, as the, pro as the sum? Negative 18. So I know whatever the math is over here, it's times 10 to the negative 18th. And my units are going to be hertz cancels hertz and leaves me with joules. And they say in here it's 1.5 times 10 to the negative 17th. which probably meant this was about 15 something, right? Which makes sense. This is a little bit more than two. This is a halfway to seven, right? <coughs> two, two times seven is 14. 15 times 10 to the negative 18th. 15 times 10 to the negative 18 would be the same as 1.5 times 10 to the negative 17. 
joules of energy. So it's just straight algebra, straight indirect relationship formula, E equals HF, or excuse me, direct relationship, and then do the math. Just knowing the formula e equals HF, plugging, plugging it in and doing the math. We have a section next, which we'll do on Monday, before we get into the Bohr model of the atom. We're going to go back to nuclear models. We had, remember, had to go into what light is, because we're going to talk about light. There are certain things we see in the atom, specifically when electrons are orbiting the nucleus, that there are times when light is emitted from the atom. There are times when light comes out, or sometimes, you know, we'll see light, it'll disappear. What's happening? Before we can talk about light in the atom, we need to kind of discuss what light is generally speaking. Now we spent a lot of time on the wave form, right? Most of our discussion on light has been the wave form. What is the other, in the duality principle, what is the other form that light can take? Okay, so it's a particle. So if we're looking to prove it's a wave, or considering its actions as a wave, we've covered a lot of that this morning, or excuse me, the last couple days, and this morning. The other duality principle is particle. And what we need to know about that right now is in the particle understanding of light, that light is a photon. It's called a photon. So, you know, when Star Trek, they launch the photon torpedoes or whatever, what they're talking about there is energy that comes from a small particle of light. If you, if you go with the concept that light is a particle as well as a wave, as we focus just on the particle, a light particle is known as a photon. It's going to be important to understand that because when we talk about the atom, we're going to see light being emitted from atoms. We're going to discuss what that means when light is emitted from atoms. And so when it emits, when it emits light, it's going to emit light both from the waveform perspective, it's going to emit waves that have certain frequencies, so we see them as certain colors, but we're also going to understand it as that light that's emitted is emitted as a particle, both a wave and a particle. And so it's a frequency of wave, wavelength that gives it color. At the same time, it's a particle of energy called a photon. So we're going to be talking out of both sides of our mouth at times. Is it a wave? Yes, it is. And here's what that looks like, and this is why it looks as color. Is it a particle? Yes, it is. And this is where it came from, and this is the direction it's going. So on one side, we kind of treat it like a BB. On the other, other side, we kind of treat it like a wave of, in the ocean. Both at the same time, both true simultaneously. How they reconcile, we don't know. But they're both simultaneously true. We're going to do experiment 3-2, or at least I intend to. It's pretty simple. Uh, not today, maybe tomorrow. Maybe I'll make several of them and have, have several of you try them. It's really interesting. Let's talk about what we're going to do before we do it. In the experiment, what we're going to do is take a piece of paper that has a large red cross on it. We're going to make a red cross, and we're going to sit it on our desk and stare at it. And just stare at the red cross for about 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Everybody's going to have their own red cross, and you're going to stare at it. And then... Maybe we have a stack of paper, white paper. Because what we're going to do is stare at it and then flip it over. Flip the stack of papers over so that we no longer have the red cross. All we have is pure white paper. What do you think is going to happen? Part of the lab is think about the experiment. Now think about what's going to happen. Right now, what do you think would happen is if I'm staring at a piece of paper that has a red cross on it and then I suddenly just have plain white paper and I'm staring at it, what am I going to see? you're going to see a red cross. Is the red cross there? No, but you see it, right? Now, as you stare at that red cross, what's going to happen? It's going to slowly fade away. But is it going to be red the whole time and slowly fade from red to nothing? Mm. It's actually going to fade away by colors. We'll talk starting on Monday of how your eye sees colors and how your brain assumes certain things. Remember how I talked about the TV and how it, from the back, the cathode ray tube, it would shoot photons or shoot cathode rays? And as the cathode rays hit each cell, some of them are red, some of them are green, some of them are blue, and they would glow. But you 
being back from a distance, you look at it and it looks like a constant picture to you. As you get closer and closer and closer, the more, impressionist, more impressionistic it looks with little dots. What actually happens in the TV is that when it fires at one pixel, it's supposed to be red and it fires and makes it red, it doesn't always keep hitting that same cell. Matter of fact, modern TVs work that way with the LEDs. Once a cell is a color, it holds that color until it's told to change colors. Your brain does the same thing, actually. And the cones and rods, in this case specifically the cones in your eyes, they tell your brain when something changes. Problem is, when they look at something for too long, they kind of get lazy and go to sleep. So the brain sees red or blue or whatever color, sees it, and over a period of time, if you see it long enough, your eye actually shuts down and says, okay, brain, I'll let you know when it changes. Otherwise, just keep telling them it's blue or red or green or whatever. But then when we actually have a change, it takes us a little bit of time to recognize that a change has happened. So that's why we're going to see red. Then the red's going to disappear, but it's going to disappear slowly because we're going to go from red, then we're going to start to see greens and blues, and then we're going to see it slowly fade into nothing to explain how our eyes actually work. See you on Monday.